great. Looks so good. Much. Sounds good. I appreciate that. I do want you to know uh, that we are recording this session. We record all of our webinars and make them publicly available on our website and YouTube account. And I say that as a qualifier in case um, you want to pose a question, but don't necessarily want anyone to know you post the question. Um, you can certainly ask us uh, directly. We'll respond to you by email if you don't want to ask a public question, but I do want to give that qualifier. Uh, as we get started. So I did uh, turn on the recording and uh, we are recording now. So welcome uh, to 2021. Uh, it's, it's sort of hard to uh, keep our heads uh, going towards just a, a lens down a path of our profession when so many things are intersecting uh, our lives and our professional work. For those of you in the clinical settings, I want to just uh, give my deep appreciation for you working tirelessly uh, amid the COVID pandemic and thank you for that work. Um, it's it's uh, probably not said enough. So let me give you a few disclosures while we're waiting uh, for a few more people to come on. I am not a certified coder. We do have a few people in our uh, profession who are probably the most uh, famous or infamous, as I call her, my friend Joni Slager, uh, has done a variety of workshops and written uh, tools on becoming a coder. And one of the things that's really important for you to know, coding is directly related to RVU, uh, as you'll learn today, if not, you didn't know that before, uh, and can sometimes be one of the most challenging pieces for midwives uh, in, in this whole mathematical equation. I also have no experience as a professional uh, biller. Uh, I'm not an expert in the subject matter. Uh, I don't know that there are any midwives in the United States that can claim that, uh, but I will tell you that I have based this presentation on nearly three months of uh, deep research, a long career uh, in conversations in a variety of practices. And as you'll see today, our work in consulting, particularly among the contracts that we've reviewed and now actually engaging with some hospitals who are trying to determine if RVUs are of value in their midwife practice uh, has really, really heightened uh, our awareness in what's going on. The contracts being shared today are real. Uh, they are redacted and they are contracts from 2020. So they are very current. I'm going to ask anybody who has their mic on to please turn them off. It'll, it'll help us a little bit. <clears throat> um, again, the need to have a basic understanding of CPT coding. The good thing for midwives is unless you're an FNP, sometimes a WHNP, we have a fairly circumscribed uh, master bill, but uh, it's really, really important uh, to have a familiarity with coding and the nuances, even the uh, new ENMs that have come out for 2021. And we have a lot to learn on how to best attribute our value and worth. And so I'm not going to leave you with just the gray skies of RVUs, uh, but perhaps uh, opportunities uh, to make things better where you are now. So let's look at some of the facts. Uh, as I shared early before uh, we started recording, uh, I, I've spent uh, quite a few years of my career uh, as a PhD researcher, know how to do research uh, discovery pretty well. Um, there are zero published research or written articles discussing uh, work RVUs model and the modeling method for the midwifery profession. I'm going to say that again, there are zero, which is why there's a lot of guessing going on that we see in these contracts as well as with some of the hospitals we're working with uh, based on, uh, you know, is, is it feasible to wanna be able to replicate a model that was designed for physician practice, but not designed for any advanced practice provider. That includes CRNAs, which probably could be more closely aligned along with the FNP uh, than the other specialty categories. 
There's a problem when billing incident two happens and it complicates the assignment of work in an RVU model. And for some advanced practice providers, it may misattribute the work to who actually did it. Uh, and that's not too hard to understand when you see a little bit about what's going on. And I guess this is just sort of my rhetorical question. If RVUs were a benefit to advanced practice providers or to midwives, where's the data and where's the research? Because RVUs uh, have been around for quite a while. So I'm gonna start with this uh, little cartoon uh, and just want you to take a look at it. I have a question, can you see on your screen, um, me letting people into the room, or is that blocked from your view? It's blocked. It's blocked. Okay. I didn't want it to sort of be in the way as we move along. Um, you know, when I when I, when I look at this cartoon, I and, and of course I did a search to find it uh, with keywords. Uh, I, I sit back now and I keep thinking about what I see here. Um, and I put in the keywords in the clip art of, um, guess what, RVUs and advanced practice providers. So I'll just let that image sort of hover here for a second as you think about the images that come to mind uh, and what can be a very likely uh, probability of tying you to uh, a very close monitoring system uh, being observed by other people. Um, so what is, a, what is an RVU? I'm going to see if I can move a couple things out of the way here. And just give me one second to, oh. sorry guys. An RVU is a relative value unit. Uh, and in 1992, Medicare worked the, with the American Medical Association to create this standardized fee schedule. Uh, so RVUs are based uh, using CPT coding. The dollar amount of an RVU is determined by calculating three things. The physician's work, the physician's practice expenses, and the physician's malpractice insurance. Note that you've not seen the word APP anywhere in this calculation. And I think if you're, if you're in a system that's being challenged by um, institutions that are wanting to use uh, big benchmark uh, data about RVUs and uh, non-physicians, they're, they're getting it from data sources that are physician driven. There aren't any that are APP driven. So it's just important for you to have that in the back of your mind um, and for you to be aware of if you're being challenged uh, on this work formula. So the physician's work is divided into four subcomponents. And this is important because you can see why a neurosurgeon would be paid more than a psychiatrist, okay? The time it takes to perform the service, the technical skills or physical effort required to perform the service, the amount of mental effort and judgment required and stress arising from any potential risk to the patient from performing the service. So do RVUs only drive Medicare reimbursement, which is why the federal government got involved with the AMA in the first place? And the answer is no, it's not limited to Medicare. Virtually every commercial carrier's benchmarks on a fee schedule lined up and crosswalked with the Medicare fee schedule. And we'll talk about how that variance happens here in a minute. But overall, commercial plans reimbursement has always been higher, of course, than what Medicare pays or Medicaid pays. We all sort of intuitively know that. And there is uh, research from the Health Cost Institute that compares commercial and Medicare reimbursement but we're starting to see a lot of fluctuation in the market as bundled payment models are rolling out for like hip replacements and oh, by the way, uh, prenatal care services. There's, there's a lot of shifting going on in the market in terms of reimbursement and how things are coded like a global fee for obstetric care and how that rolls out in an RVU model 
that the commercial companies will look at and then negotiate their own rates on. So everything always goes back to the RVUs that are assigned a CPT code. The CPT codes work in tandem with the ICD-10 codes to create a picture of what's happening for the payer. So the patient arrived with these symptoms, which is part of the ICD code, and the procedures are represented by the CPT code. So you can tell here that talking to somebody and doing general health promotion and health education without doing any procedures or diagnostic testing during that visit is not going to generate a very high RVU. The RVU does not change based on the provider rendering the service and it's based on the level of difficulty of a procedure or the acuity the high acuity needs of the patient. So to put it in the easiest terms, the more complex a patient is, the more WRVs are assigned. And the more WRVs you have, the more money you earn, which is why a cardiovascular interventionist is gonna make more money than a family practice physician. It's, it's pretty simple and um, a lot of folks are coming out of school, uh, including physicians uh, and people I know who don't have a very good understanding of what that means in relationship to their personal salary and or incentive bonus pay. So most hospital employed physicians, and we are learning rapidly, some hospital employed midwives must attain a level of X RVUs either for A, their salary, or uh, B, their bonus. And that threshold or benchmark is typically or should be designated in a contract. Employers use directories to set these benchmarks, um, looking at the average number of RVUs performed by physician types. So they categorize the types of physicians in each specialty and then divide it into each region of the country. So sometimes you will see significant variances based on which region the data is driven from. The most prominent national directory uh, that you will hear cited and, and that we're aware of is MGMA. Uh, it's quite expensive uh, to get into their database, but that's what hospitals typically use. And we have been aware that some midwives uh, have been quoted data based on MGMA. Uh, it is not formulated to suit the APP role. And I'm gonna just keep saying that because there is no data that MGMA is basing on the role of midwives in the RVU allocation. There is no time spent with longer visits in terms of being able to bill uh, legally there is no time for patient education, coordinating referrals, or any non-billable service uh, the midwife may, may be doing in the course of care. So a lot of the body of work you may do during the day may be consumed by non-RVU work, work hours. So let's look at physician WRVUs by specialty. This is the latest data I could find for 2019. And then again, it, it just sort of gives you this range of the highest median RVUs of surgeons and procedure driven physicians compared to physicians with the lowest median RVUs, which are typically your primary care docs and those who are primarily in the ambulatory setting. Now, what's really important, I think, for you to just do a mental snapshot of here. These are the average WRVUs in a year, okay? So keep that in mind when we get to the contracts we're gonna share about how many RVUs midwives are supposed to be generating uh, either for their sole compensation or for bonus and incentive compensation. So what, is, what about our OBGYN friends? Now this information I'm gonna tell you is not easy to find, uh, but if you are persistent, uh, you could probably find anything on the internet. It's a reputable source. 
Does the RVU model benefit the OBGYN? Well, here's the median RVUs for an OBGYN full scope, full time, 6,956 per year. I'm gonna go back here and look again where the OBGYN sits. They're, 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 they're pretty much reaching this highest median here because they are surgeons, right? Um, in contrast to only working in the ambulatory environment. But if you start looking at subspecialties of OBGYNs, you can see what begins to shift. This is from a PowerPoint slide deck of Dr. Tony Ogburn and his colleagues out of the University of Texas uh, that I found uh, on the internet in the public domain. And you can see the general OBGYN, that's where I got 6956. And if you just go down these categories, in the median percentile for an OB doing gynecology only, which may be your phased retired physician, uh, somebody who dropped their obstetrics and is only doing gynecology, they're sitting down here under 5,000 RVUs per year. Compared to your high working, cranking out the patients, maternal fetal medicine physician, who's the highest on this slide deck at, at nearly 17,000 RVUs per year. That is unimaginable in my mind, um, but is the data uh, that's been extrapolated in the study that's cited. Okay, so we have this number, which is an RVU number assigned to a CPT code. So what is the conversion factor? The conversion factor is the multiplier that Medicare applies to the RVUs to calculate the reimbursement. So in 2021, changes were made by the federal government. Some of you may have been following this by CMS. The conversion factor for 2021 is $32.41. In 2020, the conversion factor was $36.09. And in 1992, when the model began, the conversion factor was $31. What do you think physicians think about this? We don't have to turn the microphone on <laughs> to get the answers. And this is part of the problem of what is going on overlaid with COVID. If they're not able to do surgeries, right? Just general surgeries uh, that were not emergencies at the level they were doing before, either because the patient doesn't want to go in the hospital um, or it's just safer to delay the surgery. And on top of that, they're getting less for their RVUs for ambulatory services. They're paid far less anyway. These, these docs are starting to feel the pinch in the type of income they were generating before COVID, let alone how the conversion factors have been changing and nearly back to where it started in 1992. So again, according to my third son, Russell, there's a matter with it. And uh, unless you understand some of this tension you can't always begin to put yourself in the shoes of the providers who are trying to figure out how to make it fair and equitable for everyone. So let's, let's take a couple examples. Uh, this first one is the RVU for a total laparoscopic hysterectomy. So for all, all in the procedure involved in doing that, it's 13.36 RVUs. And if you use the Medicare conversion factor, and this was, I think, 20, uh, the 2019 one, uh, then you're going to get a, a payout of uh, $35.99. And most payment that is commercial will approach 1.5 times Medicare. I'm trying to get this one. Element two, go away. I'm not sure why I can't figure out how to do that. Um, so let's let's do the math over here. And I think I'm missing because I can't see it. 
uh, missing some of the sections. There we go, I got rid of it. <clears throat> so in 2018, if the RVU uh, was 13.36 uh, times a conversion factor of 35.99, they would have paid, been paid $480.82. Take the same conversion factor in 2021, and they're going to get paid $433 for the same procedure. And if you took 1.5 times the Medicare rate, 649. So it's a decrease in reimbursement to them for one total lap hiss of $47, $50 every time they do one. I can't imagine uh, they're very happy about that unless, unless they have a very large patient population and they're getting a lot of referrals into them. Then it may not matter too much, but the person on the line on the margins may be concerned. So let's look at what that means for RVU production and salary only. So some hospitals employ physicians and midwives <laughs> and their salary is only based on RVU. So let's look at the great, the great surgeon who's making more RVUs than anybody getting $60 per average RVU, producing 6,000, which is sort of low for a surgeon, they're gonna be bringing in $360,000 a year. That is pretty low uh, for a surgeon to be honest with you, but that is the metric that's a pretty fair average assumption. Compared to a primary care physician who might do three to 4,000 WRVs a year, a year at an average of $46 uh, per RVU that brings them out to 184,000. And then look at the midwife contract we reviewed this past year that stipulated they were going to pay the midwife a, her salary of $25 per RVU and that she would get 5,000 RVUs in a year for a salary of $125,000. She was totally clueless thought it was a great, great deal and was being highly honored. And we said, our advice is throw it away and come up with another compensation model, which they actually did. But the problem is we don't have an answer. We know the average number of RV used by an OBGYN, pretty reliable data. We know that if you assume an OBGYN like anybody works about 200 working days a year, and that is taking out weekends, time off, some vacation time, and they're gonna average 6,596 RVUs in a year. That's about 33 RVUs in a day. How is a midwife going to do that? What should be the average RVUs for a midwife per day, per year, when we're not doing high acuity and high procedures? Uh, it is simply impossible, and quite honestly, we have no clue. It may look like we're going the same direction on a team, but, but my suggestion is uh, we don't have an answer. We don't know what the outcome is. We don't know what the destination is. People are just, just taking shots in the dark. I think with goodwill generally in mind, but without any knowledge of what they're doing. So I was able to um, find just recently from Sullivan Cotter, who's the other very big group who puts out information on salaries in addition to MGA, and we'll talk about advanced practice providers. This infographic they released uh, in 2020. <clears throat> now there is a, <clears throat> a lot of valuable information here that I'm not gonna talk about tonight, which talks about sign-on bonuses, relocation assistance, retention bonuses. Those are all things you should be thinking about when negotiating a contract. But what I do want you to focus on is the very middle of the right-hand side of the infographic, which I hope you can see pretty well. And I think I have a couple of listeners on here that I know are hospital-based RVU tracked midwives. The average, so the nurse practitioner PA for three straight years, average WRVUs, primary care, which would be ambulatory, a little over 3,000 RVUs, hospital-based, a little over 2,000 RVUs, and medical surgical could fit into a lot of combinations of types of practices. But the point here is in 
Sullivan Cotter's data, of which there isn't anybody else out there I know, collecting advanced practice provider data as good as they do. When I asked them to give me the entire survey, they gratefully would for $11,000, which I was not willing to give them. Uh, we, we know some facts here, even though their population is skewed. And I'll show you that later. But for a nurse midwife, either in ambulatory or hospital-based or blended to probably capture more than 3,500 RVUs is pretty unlikely. And to be honest, that's about half of an OBGYN, which seems extremely reasonable to me. Um, so <clears throat> just sort of keep that number in mind as well. Okay, we're gonna think about a common code, 99385, which is an annual exam for an 18 to 39 year old. We still have some people coming in, sorry about that. Um, for an average of 1.9 uh, RVUs for that visit. If, if an OBGYN needs 33 RVUs per day, just for this one coded category, and this is, I think is a return visit. I don't think it's a new visit. They would need to do 17 of those in a day. So think about that as a midwife. The simple, return visits, even if they're longer visits, are very, very low RVUs unless they become complex. The new patient is what everybody wants because there are more RVUs that are tied to the new patient. So uh, we're now seeing some midwives who the physician has to see all the new patients and then they will allow the midwife to see patients because they're looking for those higher RVUs. So anyway, What's the work volume expected to be? Should it be equivalent? And if not, you know, what is a fair number? What if the midwife did all the normal exams and the physician did the high acuity exams? That's where you begin to sell the reason of the value of the midwife. So their time is freed up for more complex patients, more surgery, more procedures. The question of who gets the RVUs for routine maternity care. If it's a global fee, it is typically the physician who's capturing those RVUs, just as they are capturing the low cesarean section rate for the practice that the midwives are providing them. So I'm not saying it's necessarily bad. Somebody needs to capture the RVUs. What I'm saying is, do you know how your value is being estimated, particularly if there's an RVU model within the system, but the midwife is not a part of it? And the last is when RVUs are shared or become incident to, then it becomes really muddled uh, because typically all those RVUs are captured uh, by the physician. So here is a five CNM uh, practice in a university hospital, 2020 RVU report. And what's important I think to see here is if you look at the RVUs billed by month, you can see they never really even get up to 300 per month. We're not even over 2000 in this model. And how would you expect to be uh, bonused, which they were hoping they would get when you don't understand the metrics, you don't know what the benchmark is, you don't know what the conversion factor is here, uh, and you don't, you don't know what you're reaching for in the stars. These are their top 10 service codes that these midwives did, which is outpatient established, new visit, preventive established, all these low RVUs. See these low numbers here? 1.0, 1.9. What's the highest one? A normal spontaneous vaginal delivery at 33.9. So the number of births you do is huge. And we're going to talk about whether you use the RVU as a factor in discussion or whether you use an average billable amount and how that plays out in, in how people think about revenue generation. So what are the advantages of RVUs? You can compensate bonuses on equivalent work. So if Shana and Kathleen and Ann and Monica and I are all doing the same thing 
we're all billing. Uh, the CPT uh, and RVUs are going out in the same billing model. I want you to know, however, that compensation of any bonus of any kind is taxed separately, anything outside your salary. So that's important to know. It will encourage the provider to have a steady stream of patients, especially if there is any motivation, base salary or bonus package tied to it. It will cause competition to get more new patients uh, because the hospitals uh, need you uh, to keep busy and to keep giving them referrals. So usually uh, people become hustlers it encourages the provider to be more productive. So you're likely to see more patients and perform more evaluations and procedures. It is not outcomes-based metrics. Outcomes-based metrics are typically a separate incentive model that uh, some contracts try to balance the RVU model with so that there is an awareness that your practice is being monitored on outcomes as well as productivity. Um, it's paid on codes submitted, uh, not codes collected and paid for, and it's not affected by differences in insurance panels. So what are the disadvantages of RV use? When it's only used as a compensation for uh, base salary, uh, most of the literature I read is that physicians will leave over time. Uh, they just get burnt out. Uh, they feel like that cartoon you saw where they're constantly being tracked and asked to do more and more and more. And the value is, is a numeric value rather than a team value or a value to the mission, vision, and core of, of that system. Uh, some RVUs are paid on a sliding scale to ramp up competition. I'll show you an example of that in a contract we saw. I mentioned this before, but RVUs do not pay for everything we do. Uh, mentoring, admin time, if you're, a, if you're a service director, teaching residents, going to meetings, uh, tasks outside of direct care of patients. Um, and this is a little disturbing to me in the world of midwifery, but less likely to refer patients and compete for new patients. We got, I think we need to be very careful about keeping patients longer than we should and trying to manage a moderate to more complex case when it might actually be out of the realm uh, because, because of RVUs. You're paid for the volume of care, not the quality of care. I've already mentioned that bundled procedures are paid less. It's interesting that modifiers will create less RVU value. An interesting example I saw of that is a surgeon who's doing a mastectomy, uh, if he's doing both breasts at the same time, will be paid less than if he did one, uh, at, one at one surgical day and the other on another surgical day. I was literally blown away uh, when I read that. Uh, and the other is incorrect codes or undercoding will contribute to underperforming. And I think this is where a lot of practices, whoever makes up the practice, that don't have expert coding and billing staff get into a lot of trouble. Because it is, it is pretty complex uh, in terms of how you uh, enter the codes and all the modifiers and e &M that goes along with it um, that has to be accurate. So what are the possible pitfalls uh, related to midwife RVU compensation? First of all, if you're not recognized as an independent provider, we have seen many employment contracts that defer all, all of the billing for services to the physician or the practice group. And that literally means if they choose to enforce it, that they have taken over all of your RVUs. They're all assigned to the physician or the group. Now, is that a problem if there's no RVU model in the contract? No, it's not a problem at all. The physicians are actually motivated to bring on midwives because of this. 
but you at least need to be smart and say, you know, uh, help me understand how my work volume is valued in this practice. It's a great question and one that they may go, wow, you know, that's an interesting question. Let's talk about it. We already mentioned work attributed to the physician provider billing incident two will not direct income generated to the midwife or the PA or whoever uh, they're billing incident two for. If the midwife contributes to bundle care and RV use are not attributed, uh, let's say that it's a group practice and the midwife did most of the prenatal care and the doc does the delivery. What happens to that bundled fee payment? You're not splitting it out among different providers outside of that group. It's all staying within that group. So it's likely to be bundled under uh, the delivering physicians uh, identifiers. Uh, it's very difficult to find anywhere RVUs attributed to triage, care coordination, labor support, on-call services, post-op rounding and shared visits. Um, and if it is coded, uh, they are very, very, very small RVUs. You need to think about the time allocated between ambulatory clinic care and the hospital setting. The more time you're in the hospital, the less time you see ambulatory office patients, the less RVUs you're going to be making. That is just the way it works. It uh, doesn't matter what kind of provider you are. Uh, and interestingly, the, the midwives that, that work for the hospital, the RVU sheet that we saw that I didn't spend a lot of time explaining because it, there's much more complexity to it. Uh, they, were, they were sitting um, pretty low on their RVUs uh, probably because of the limitation, I would imagine, of ambulatory clinic visits that they have outside of prenatal care. CPT codes for midwives uh, and what we use are not as complex or procedurally based because the OB care is global. We often do longer patient visits, so we're not seeing as many patients in a day. And the ENM codes have lower RV values as well as the CPT codes. So let's look at five midwifery contracts from 2020. And uh, I'm willing to, uh, we're, we're sitting at just about 36 people on this, to have some discussion if it would be helpful for you uh, to do that. Um, I can open up, it's probably already open, the chat board um, if you'd like to put some questions in there. Uh, or if you want to use the mic, I'm, I'm willing to do that as well. This is a contract where they were required. It was a, it was a requirement in the contract uh, to do a minimum of 3,500 RVUs per year. However, there were no repercussions outlined in the agreement if it was not achieved. The minimum work expectations for the midwife was 48 hours a week, but there was no maximum. They were offered a salary of 89,000 and there was no conversion factor listed or any incentive bonus based beyond the 3,500 required. So uh, what do you think about that? I have some emojis here that, that tell you what I think. Uh, I think there's a lot wrong with this. Uh, it's a very low starting salary for midwives. Uh, to expect a minimum to be 3,500 is completely unrealistic. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of contracts we say we see have minimum work expectations, but not maximum. And what happens if you're beyond the maximum? Yes, we have burnout. Uh, the midwife's going to work really hard to do the best they can to reach 3,500 but it's probably pretty unaware of how unattainable that really is. And if they did reach 3560, what's the conversion factor they're gonna be paid out on? And you'll see in some of these contracts that are gonna follow, they list that conversion factor 
and it is a variable as wide as the RV used per year, which is simply mind blowing. But here's the second agreement. This is a straight 40 hour work week with an incentive bonus based on a benchmark of 1900 in the first year. And all RVUs above the benchmark were paid at $35 per RVU with a starting salary of 107,000. What do you think? I, you know, you can see my, my, my thoughtful emoji there. Uh, that's, that's not bad, guys. Uh, it's actually all right. Yeah, you're right. That's, that's pretty sweet, to be honest with you. Um, now, the question, yeah, you're right, Ann. <laughs> The question that I would say in this discussion and negotiation, I think all of them need to be negotiated, is this paid out to the midwife as an individual provider? Is this paid out to the team of midwives? What kind of population base is in the community you're gonna be working in? How many providers are you competing with to get patients? Who's the scheduler that puts people on your schedule? Like, this looks really good. And I would go back with a whole lot of questions, um, including things that are gonna come up here in a minute beyond what I just explained. But the problem with this particular individual was they didn't have a really good understanding of what was being offered and didn't really know what kind of questions to go back with. So here's the third agreement. This is a proto productivity compensation. Look, 41.43 per RVU worked in excess of 28.50 annually. And the RVUs are calculated by the employer, which was a very vague statement, but you could probably get averages or trends from the past with a base salary of 107. Again, that could be pretty sweet. Uh, but it depends on where you're working. If you're working in a hospital as a midwife, you are very, very unlikely to achieve 2850. Remember on that example I so showed you earlier, they barely broke 2000, which means you may be working your little tail off uh, doing 50 to 60 hours a week and you're never gonna attain 2850 RVUs, but your hopes are there that you will. So like, what is the incentive here? What, what is sort of the context behind what all of this means where you wanna drive a conversation to understand the work environment you're going into? It's really, really important to figure out what the ethos is of work expectations. Here's a fourth agreement. Now this was enough to just simply make me do more than scratch my head I was probably hitting my head. And I only put in this, there were probably three more sections in the contract just like this that described RVU compensation and they never listed a conversion factor. They just went on and on and on talking about potential midwife codes and charges uh, and it was one hot mess. Uh, and we basically said to this person, this is totally meaningless. I would go back, have the entire thing struck and ask for something uh, that has meaning. Here's another one, the fifth agreement, which is a tiered model that we talked about earlier that I found in the research. It's a little bit difficult to understand, especially how it is, this is copy and pasted from the contract, uh, looking at a $32 per RVU um, but the benchmarks weren't clearly listed for the four quarters. So whatever that production surplus is, those, those values will be tiered up based on when you start. You're not going to have many RVUs the first quarter, but you're going to have exponentially more at the end of the fourth quarter. We don't know what the benchmarks are here. Of, of what this means at all. 
uh, what, what they have to meet and what the surplus is. So uh, there's a question here by Annie. Let me stop just a second. If there's a minimum requirement for a number of RVUs, no extra compensation until you reach that number. Some of these lists require RVUs that are barely, in a, barely attainable. So you can never count on extra compensation. <laughs> exactly. Also a bonus tax at 25 to 33, 33%. So what's the point? Well, Annie, this is the point. A lot of midwives are being snowed and I don't know any nicer way to say it. <laughs> so I'm just going to stop there for now. We'll keep going uh, and we'll get into more conversation as we move along here. So what can midwives do? Uh, you have to understand language, expectations and negotiate. And if you don't understand the language, it's okay to say, look, I don't know a lot about what you're describing here. You're going to have to help me understand it in a way that it makes sense. That's a fair thing to do in a negotiation process. The contract needs to say what the conversion factor is. I would ask if there's a difference between the conversion factor of a midwife and a physician. It's a fair question. Is there any non-billable time tracked, valued, and compensated in this position? Is the bonus for excess RV use per year set on an evidence-based benchmark? And if it is, I would love for you to find out and let me know as soon as you know, <laughs> because there isn't one. Uh, what is the average RVU generated by the physicians in the practice, if they will share that with you, and the midwives in the practice? And, you know, I have some friends who work on an RVU model in a large midwife group employed by physicians. And those midwives who wanna make more money are working their tails off. They're not doing it as a team. It's very competitive for the new midwife that comes in that's replacing the old midwife that got burned out. And it can be very destructive to team dynamics, but it is important to know if it's written in your contract. And what happens if you don't meet the benchmark? You need to know. You also need to get to know the office staff coders. <laughs> you need to do self auditing and you need to ask for a monthly report. You need to understand how politics play a role in productivity. And that is all about, do you have enough space to see patients? Do you have assistants to work up the room and do the labs and clean the room? Uh, do you have access to new patients, all of those things that make a difference in time that affects productivity. You need to keep a log of all non-billables that bring value. Are you giving grand rounds? Are you participating in, in MMR meetings? Are you part of the state PQI team? What are those things that bring value to the system but cannot be tracked in an RVU? And lastly, again, I feel really strongly about this. I've seen uh, individual-based midwife RVU models be very destructive to a team. Uh, and it's one I would explore uh, as advice to anybody going into one. So what might be some alternatives? I don't wanna leave you with, okay, now what am I supposed to do? <laughs> there are other types of compensation models and net collections is one we promote widely. It's sometimes referred to as net production and it's the actual cash received for services rendered. Now that is important to know because you wanna see what the profit margin is after the costs, right? So looking at cash received recorded as actual revenue is pretty common. It's about as common and may be aligned at the same time, um, practices are monitoring that right along with RVU. So, Here's what we would suggest. And this is what happened to the one person who was offered 125,000 for 5,000 RVUs. Determine what a fair percent of net collections is above expenses. And it can be counted as a bonus beyond the base salary. So let's say uh, you generated a $200,000 profit margin after expenses, and you're gonna negotiate 10% of profit. That's a $20,000 bonus without any worry about RVUs and all the shenanigans that go on behind the scenes. You're giving all those RVUs to your physician colleagues. You just want to be 
recognized for your contributions to the practice. I'll go into a little bit more detail on that in a minute, but that is a very popular model as a counter negotiation to get RVUs out of your contract. You have to be able to demonstrate the financial value in some kind of performa. Uh, and we do help people do that. It's not as complicated as you think, but here's a simple example using eight bursts per month or 96 per year using CPT code 59400. If one RVU for a global maternity fee is 36.58 RVUs, and you take that times a conversion factor for 96 per year, you're gonna get 113,000, right? Commercial's gonna come out at about 1.5 times Medicare. And I know Medicare is not babies, but it all factors the same. If you think differently, okay, let's not think about WRVUs right now, but let's think about net collections and just say 3,000 is the average number of revenue generated net received for a birth. And it fluctuates widely, I know that. Times 96, look at the difference, $288,000 generated. That's where a performa based on net collections is going to make a midwife's value much better than on an RVU model. So I'm, I'm just giving you this information to make you ponder, uh, but it can be very helpful in being calculated in how you negotiate. So what are, the, what are the challenges of determining RVU revenue generation over net collections? Well, you need to calculate what every CPT code might be that a midwife could bill for. You need to know what the conversion factor is assigned to the midwife for the billing, whether it's Medicare or commercial. You have to be able to include things like first assist. Are you doing ultrasounds? Are you doing uh, urinary dysfunction uh, testing? What all are you doing that's higher billable than low RVU um, ambulatory exams? You have to know the region because, right, physician RVUs are based on the region they're in. And you have to know if this is being billed incident to or directly to you as an LIP licensed independent provider. Sometimes state regulations may intervene here. Sometimes hospital bylaws will codify how the non-physician providers billables are collected, interestingly enough, uh, and definitely contracts do. What do you do if they don't give you numbers? Uh, then you say you're interested or you're not. You know, you, the number game is what negotiation is all about. And my opinion is you come back with this, this doesn't work for me, or this model would work for me in an RVU. This model might be better in a net generation model for all of us. Then we're not fighting over RVUs and we're giving a fair bonus uh, based on my responsibility, my economic responsibility for you paying for my overhead, my malpractice insurance, my health benefits. But I'm gonna tell you here on this slide, in the performance that we've done and the metrics that we have used in a lot of states with a lot of midwives, in addition to the work the Pacific Business Group on Health did in showing the value of midwives in California. When you look at data on receivables for births per month with a blended case mix on annual exams and additional billable procedures. So the more services you offer, uh, with higher revenue generation, AKA higher RVUs. After you account for salaries, malpractice insurance, benefits and overhead, midwives are in general generating on average over $250,000 of profit per year. And why you can't negotiate for a 20 to $50,000 bonus makes no sense to me. But if you, if you don't present the numbers, it's, they're just simply not gonna listen. The performa doesn't have to be complicated, but you have to be able to explain it and uh, be willing to assume some risk along the way. And, and really the truth is a physician practice and MGMA has articles out on this. 
physician practices that have APPs working with them make significantly more money than those who bring in more physicians competing for those high RVUs when they can give those low RVUs to non-physician providers. So what are some other incentive-based compensation models we've seen uh, that are of value that you can add, right? We've seen some contracts with four different types of incentive-based compensation models. They may have RVUs, they may have quality indicators, they may have patient satisfaction indicators. Um, and so these are all worth thinking about as other ways to bring in money beyond the base. So what are quality and outcome indicators? They're typically determined by the system you work for. They may have percentages established with whoever, leapfrog, joint commission, depends on where you work, uh, related to things like readmission, access to care. Are you attending uh, quality meetings? Do you participate in some of these state-based organizations? Are you doing professional contributions? Uh, all of those things add up. Uh, these are typically more often seen in hospital academic university contracts than community private practice, but there's no reason why they cannot be attributed as an incentive to any practice. Um, because your work in the community, whether it's professional or, or um, in any way contributing to who they are is representative of their value uh, in the community and the nation, quite honestly. Looking at press Ganey data or any in-practice survey methods about patient satisfaction uh, we have seen, as well as some, although not many, looking at the number of encounters or experiences. We often see this in more, uh, how do I say this? Less complex contracts with small private practices. Maybe the midwife owns the practice or maybe a single physician owns the practice and there's some shared model um, that is created here. It's, it's the smaller groups uh, that tend to have these kinds of descriptors in them. So uh, of over the 300 contracts we have now reviewed, there is a wide range of conversion factors and RVU benchmarks that we've seen. I've given you just a glimpse of some of the diversity of what people are looking at with base salaries that uh, may be with or without an incentive with defined work weeks that I shared earlier are, are quite variable. Uh, very few, but some have minimum and maximum hours. And what happens if you go over maximum hours, either by a call or clinic uh, remuneration for additional work and a variety of types of incentive models uh, beyond just one within a single agreement. So what are our, our conclusions uh, that MGA, MGMA, who is considered the gold standard uh, has literally uh, been quite the voice in talking about APP roles and RVU compensation uh, with minimal, minimal data on midwives in particular. Uh, Sullivan Cotter is a group, I was working with a midwife in a hospital practice who was quoted Sullivan Cotter data by their HR team. And this is really, I think, quite fascinating to look, like, look at. And, and I, this is in the public domain. I didn't pay $11,000 for this. It's 2019 example of their survey data. This is a university a medical school midwifery practice. And they were told the number, okay, of, <laughs> of, uh, data points on salary and RVUs and all kinds of things. And in this survey for 2019, they had no respondents in that category, none. And if you look at the total number of respondents that they have in their 2019 database, it's about a thousand people divided amongst how many APP professions pretty shocking to me and certainly not anything I would call valid in negotiating 
uh, for midwives. So in order to effect effectively negotiate RVUs, you need to understand the language and the metrics described within the agreement. Again, ask about the average number of RVUs for the physicians and the midwives. If it's in the contract, they know that answer. If they don't want to answer that question, then I would say, can you help me understand why that's not a shared uh, data point? Uh, because I would think that would be used to incentivize your providers to uh, be very happy with their work or to work harder. What is your access to new patients? The types of patients? Who schedules the appointments? Do you have space, support staff, and enough office days, right? If you're working two to three office days, you're not going to be working enough office days to have enough RVUs for even half of what an OBGYN does. The payer mix is important in terms of net generation, net income generation, not so much RVUs. Does it make you compete with other people? Are the physicians gonna be frustrated with you? I talked to a group today, um, a large hospital that's trying to ramp up uh, three midwives to more and the financial uh, administrative manager was on this call with a physician and several of the midwives. And I said, so if you're gonna roll out RVUs for the first time in this hospital-owned physician practice, and you've got midwives that you want to have, have more births in the system, who's gonna get those RVUs? And, and everybody was just quiet. This is like total quiet because their salaries are now going to be based on RVU. So why would the physicians want to embrace the midwives if they're going to be in direct competition? So how do you reframe that, that, that conversation to make it a win-win for everybody? And probably the most important question of all is how hard as well as how do you want to work? It's okay to be someone who just you know wants to see as many patients as you can see if you believe you're rendering safe care and you like that sort of high tension high volume environment or are you someone who wants to practice midwifery in a very different way where your appointments are 30 to 45 minutes not 10 to 15 and that you don't want your work day to be 10 hours. You wanna go home after eight hours and have your charts completed. The more patients you see, the more charts you have to complete. It, it's a domino effect. And sometimes that question is probably not really thought about enough. So there's a few resources I wanna leave you with if you wanna play around with numbers like I did for the presentation. There's a free searchable Medicare physician fee schedule. All you have to do is put the code in here, 99404, the number of units, one, 10, 100, and it will calculate the RVUs for you right there. Uh, very, very fun uh, thing to play with when you're trying to create a performa based on RVUs, that is where you would go. It's important, and if you're an ACOG member, freely accessible, I don't think it is if you're not, I could be wrong. 2021 has new ENM changes. They reduce one, reduce, they eliminated one of the categories um, of patient encounters. And they have a great short little uh, PowerPoint uh, slide deck talking you through uh, changes in coding for OBGYN patients. And this one could be your little sister guide or brother guide to looking at the RVUs. Uh, the Women's Preventative Services Initiative has a 2020 coding guide, hasn't changed that much for 21. And you can look up all of these categories that you provide services for and begin to get smart about your RVUs. And if you just want to play for a day or a week or a month, it could be really valuable to begin to learn what you're generating based on RVUs because data drives change. The more you get into this and understand it, the more power you will have in understanding how to negotiate for yourselves. So my advice is you need to understand the value of the numbers in order to negotiate work.
really, really important and uh, not necessarily easy to do, but it is possible to do it. I want to just take one second to talk about the services that we provide. We have professional coaching on a variety of things that midwives are looking for. Of course, we review contracts and employment agreements. Uh, we're helping a fair number of people with business development startup of either private midwife practices alongside units and birth centers. We work uh, with interprofessional groups on team facilitation. We have a, co a couple uh, going on right now with midwifery groups and OB departments trying to get them on a better working relationship. Interestingly, RVUs is confounding one of them, uh, as well as scaling up midwifery practices. We are working with two midwifery education programs, new startups, and have a third program coming on early this year and one in Saudi Arabia and uh, working on a lot of speaking engagements over the year. But the most exciting thing I wanna share with you that we should have released, and we're gonna beta test it with a couple groups uh, before the end of the month, is an interactive financial tool for midwife practice startups. I so value what the Pacific Business Group on Health did and Barb Hughes, uh, rest in peace, Barb, uh, who died last year, who contributed a lot of work to the financial assets of midwives in America. Where they left off was the perform is there for the CNM value, but we did not have a mechanism to get people to uh, a tool that you can enter all the metrics we've been talking about today the number of midwives, their salary, their benefits, the cost of Q-tips, uh, the cost of chairs and tables. Uh, we have an interactive uh, tool that has been uh, designed with Leslie and my husband and my input with a phenomenal uh, financial wizard in an Excel format. And we will be able to help people one-on-one -on -one, either with starting their own midwifery practices or uh, starting uh, birth centers or alongside units. We wanna thank you uh, definitely for being with us. We love uh, hearing your reviews and any comments you wanna leave uh, about what we're doing in the general scope. And I'm gonna stop there uh, and see if there are any questions. We have about 20 minutes left. Uh, I'll do my best to answer them. And you can use your mic if you want. Uh, or you can type in the chat room and I'll try to keep track of them that way. I have a question that, um, thank you for this. This was um, so useful and helpful. Um, and I have a question. You, one of the slides earlier said um, that a surgeon, the um, rate per RVU was $60. Where, right. where did that, where does that come from? That's an average that a surgeon is making for the types of services they provide. Per, so that's an average per RVU that is generated from? So, so from the MGMA database. So let's say a general abdominal surgery is going to factor out at about $60. Okay. Um, so that, that's data uh, that each specialty has a metric that that essentially gives averages. And if you look at some of these uh, consulting services that talk to physicians about how to calculate their RVUs, they're using that kind of general data to help people figure out what their salary might look like. So they're better able to negotiate um, as incoming new physicians. It takes longer to get those patient practices built up. Okay, and may I ask one more question please? Sure. Thank you. Um, what happens if you are a, I had a um, client on the phone today, we were talking through her RVUs and she said, I said, what were your RVUs from your last position? And she said, I don't, this is an NP, not a midwife, but yeah. she said, uh, they wouldn't give them to me. Oh. And I, and I said, and I, and I wonder how you respond. Cause I have a way in which I respond. Yeah. Um, and I, which I am pretty sure is correct, but I wondered if you can share how do you respond to that? And yeah, I would, I would probably first, and go back to the contract and have them review the contract and look for the clause that describes RVU compensation. Okay. And then I would use the verbiage from the contract. My contract says this, and in order for me to be fully informed, 
about how I'm being paid, I need to know what the numbers are. And, you know, I trust you, but can you help me understand why you wouldn't share with me and you would share with a physician? Or, you know, there's no legal reason uh, why they shouldn't. And there's every legal reason why they should if they included it in the contract. Okay, I think what I was told, and I don't know, I mean, I hope there's truth to it, but I was that with the CMS, if someone is submitting your billing, I think this comes out of um, Buppert, uh, her book, yeah. that if someone is submitting your billing on your behalf, then you uh, have access to those numbers because um, from the person who's submitting them because, you know, through CMS, but I don't, I think that you should, because if you're not auditing them and they're over billing, you're the one who's going to be in trouble by the federal government. Right. Okay. <laughs> right. I mean, you're right. Yeah. Are, right. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a big deal. Uh, and I would really question the practices going on there if they end up refusing completely. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to say your name right, but uh, I see DESA. Uh, oh, it's Mandisa. Disa. Oh, it's Mandisa. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Hey, how are you? I'm fine. <laughs> Good. So at my um, job, you know, in North Carolina, how we have the supervisory language. So at my job, um, when anyone, I'm a hospitalist only. So when anyone comes in, it's only under the physician name. And um, I mean, if we do vaginal delivery, we chart it. So is it fair to assume that the physicians are getting all the credit and I should probably ask? Um, how only, I value if, only Mandisa if RVUs are part of your contract. Are they? They aren't, but like these midwives, like I've been there for two and a half years and like some of these midwives didn't get raised for like five years. So I'm trying to think, you know, if I'm there long term, like I'm gonna have to argue something to get more money. Well, what you could do, and this is gonna answer Kate's question, how do you how do you get started? <laughs> right? You use two free tools that are in this PowerPoint. And this will go up on our website as soon as we can get our IT people to get it up there. You, you look at the uh, Medicare database for physician RV use, and you use your super bill or your master bill with your primary codes. And you have that little booklet from the other resource that I gave you that has all the CPT codes for women's health in it. And you will plug in, okay, our group of midwives, Mandisa, did 30 births this month. How many RVUs is that worth? And do, I would say do six months worth of data. Uh, three months isn't a lot. Six months gives you a better trend line on highs and lows, especially with birth numbers. So you're going to get an average in there somewhere. Um, and then you're going to have a number. And you will have something tangible to talk about. Uh, if you want to take the time to do all the ambulatory visits that go on, if you, if they're billing for triage outside of global, I don't know how that's working. You can do that, but you're going to get the biggest number fastest. Remember those RVUs, I think were 33, 36, something like that for a birth versus one for an ambulatory visit. Uh, those numbers are going to come out uh, much higher, faster. That's what I would suggest you do uh, because you can't just invent numbers, uh, but your birth numbers are pretty trackable and pretty fast to do that math on. Sounds good. Thank you. Sure. Uh, we're considering sharing RVUs as a practice. Good. I think sharing means among all the midwives. We believe that sharing inpatient RVUs would be particularly important. Yes, I agree. Um, and Megan, this would be my advice is that, um, again, do, do a trend line. Uh, if they're going to report out, they must be doing RVUs in this model by individual provider, very trackable. You saw that on the hospital example of five midwives I gave you. You saw those five names up there that I redacted and what their RVUs were to date and by year uh, to, to track it for six months. Not as something punitive, but maybe an education curve or a, oh my gosh, you know, we just hired Anne. Uh, she hasn't been seeing that many patients yet because we're still onboarding her. We're still on-ramping her. 
there are reasons why people's productivity may be down. Or I'm going to pick on you, Anne. Anne had a baby and she was on 12 weeks maternity leave. There's no way she could have, you know, made those RVs up. See if you can find rational reasons uh, to be able to do that. And uh, then have group conversations, practice conversations where you talk about what it means and if people need to be motivated. I mean, maybe they do if that's the only thing you're counting, but maybe they're doing something else that's not billable that you're not doing. Maybe they're chairing a committee that takes up an immense amount of time and doing ACM benchmarking. I don't know. But you have to think about the person's whole body of work, not just the point of care. Does it make sense that a midwifery group could share inpatient RVUs, but it would be impossible from a legal standpoint to share outpatient RVUs? Well, I think that's an interesting question, Annie. Uh, and I don't know the answer to that. And I'm not gonna give you any legal advice, uh, but I think it's important to explore what the options are. And yeah, Erin, I'm thinking I've seen some agreements that don't say that. And, and again, I'm not an expert. I'm giving you a, a, a tremendous amount of information that I've gleaned, but I'm not going into the legal aspects. And I think those are valid questions. If, if we now know in this webinar, some have done completely opposite models based on a legal interpretation somebody's wrong here. That's the only way it can be because you can't have both. Uh, I think that midwifery would do better if it was allotted by teams uh, as practice and share, share work, not just the patient work, but all kinds of work within a practice. Um, it makes the team a team rather than an isolated provider who happens to work on a group with 10 other midwives. Other questions? Um, I have one question. Um, the, do you have any data because I on or have you seen any trends um, from your work about when you know the the implications of when um, OBGYN groups, whether they're midwives or physicians, are incentivized based on RVUs, on, on comp plans based on RVUs, knowing full well that when we are incentivized to do more, we do more very often, which has, you know, been played out in the world of cardiology and, and stent placement, you know, time and time again. So um, is, is there any kind of data that you know of in the world of, you know, in our world of practice about um, cause I, you know, you I like higher C-section rates and any data that says, well, when you're incentivized, I mean, I know I used to work with an OBGYN who the day she was on call, she had six to seven inductions lined up like for that day. Right. Um, and she was in a private, a small, you know, practice. And, um, and I just wonder, you know, what happens when, you know, it's one thing to talk about, you know, bonuses and, and compensation, and those are fair things. And then what happens when you start to look at what incentivization does what to does. like our profession, yeah. which is, you know, more C-sections. If, if I'm not wrong, and there's too many numbers that have been floating around, and I wish I would have put that comparative in the slide deck. It's a great point. And I do not believe the RVUs for a C-section are much higher than a vaginal delivery, if it's normal. Uh, the complexity goes up by other um, modifiers, hypertension, you know, uh, morbid obesity, uh, the layers begin to add on, but I don't think the RVUs are that different in that scenario. I would flip it to be uh, what could be the positive in an RVU model where a midwife, I mean, we saw a couple contracts that weren't bad. Again, I don't know if they were group uh, driven, uh, I don't know, I didn't, we don't investigate where they're practicing, right? We just look at what's in front of us. Um, is midwives who do ultrasound training, first assist training, uh, who might have other billable services beyond what we do anyway in our scope of practice that uh, become significant RVU generators? 
uh, that could add value to the individual midwife or uh, the practice as a whole and not necessarily be a uh, change the outcomes, I guess. Now, do I believe in 10 ultrasounds in a pregnancy? No. Uh, do some people do that? Yes. Uh, but I think as we see more uh, bundled payments roll out, that there is some disincentives coming out. It's a good question. Yeah, thank you. Aaron said, we've argued away our VUs and contracting for both our MDs and CNMs in our recent negotiations. That is an interesting trend, Aaron, that I saw in some of the articles uh, because of what you see CMS doing, the cost of care issues that, um, that are spiraling, um, what's happening uh, just in that total badge hiss you saw, uh, the decrease in reimbursement. Um, the physicians are starting to catch on, I think to what that means in their work-life balance. And I think we're seeing younger professionals of all types uh, really looking at how hard do I wanna work? And that's a really honest question in a very complicated career now. With EMR um, and all the other things that, that have sort of complicated ICD-10, all those things that a lot of our older physicians left because of, She's uh, are bombarding uh, some of our younger physicians with, look, this isn't fun. This isn't what I wanted to do. And now you're going to make me work under yeah. a that is an RVU model. Well, that doesn't sound good. Um, Annie, do you have any examples? Yes, let me get you some. You might want to mute if you're, if you're not talking. Uh, do you have any example of a time log showing the value of a CNM of CNM time that is not billable. Uh, the best response I have to that, and I could be wrong, is a time log that would show how many patients you see in a day and the types of patients they are. So you get an average number of patients per week and, and whether they're OB or GYN and whether they're complex or, or, or not. Uh, those are actually built into things like Athena and a variety of other uh, programs where you can extrapolate mm -hmm. that pretty easily, but I don't know, Annie, where you work. Um, I would ask your practice manager if that could be done for you. Wouldn't be hard for them to do, I don't think at all. They would even likely have uh, the coding built into some of those databases. So you could go do some snooping around uh, with some of those platforms that I've shown you tonight. Did that make sense, Annie? Other questions? Um, we have about five more minutes. If not, I wanna let you know that uh, we will have this up on our website. Uh, we appreciate you being here. We really want more midwives to not be uh, snowballed uh, and be really active in understanding um, what, what you're doing. And I don't think necessarily it's designed with the intention to not value us, but look, there is no research out there. And so when people are trying to do their best guess and they haven't done even the minimal amount of research I've done, uh, they may not have an idea. And now you've got a little bit of information, not just to, to use this PowerPoint, but to create your own database of information that can get you involved in a dialogue. And it's fascinating uh, what I've learned, which is something I truly believe. I don't think most employers expect non-physician providers to negotiate. I think they expect you to respond as we would as, as registered nurses. And when you go in with a list of really organized questions and uh, are able to have an intellectual conversation, they, I think their level of excitement about who you are actually rises uh, because there is an investment in wanting to understand how it works. I don't see it as a, as a 
put off at all. And I think sometimes midwives are afraid they ask too many questions, they're not going to get the job. I think it's the, I think it's the exact opposite if you ask the right questions the right way. So I'm going to stop for tonight. Thank you all for being here and uh, best wishes uh, as 21 comes around the corner. Stay healthy um, and we'll see you again. Bye everyone. But of course, you've already signed this contract. Yeah, but he likes to act like it's negotiable all the time.